This week on the Back Table Podcast. We've seen, especially during the time of COVID, I think a lot of people thought, look, I don't want to deal with the administration of a practice. I don't want to deal with the variability. I'm going to go to work for a hospital system and I'm going to have a secure job and get a paycheck. And as we've learned, that's not always the case. Physicians can be fired just like anybody else. Yeah. Whereas, you know, with my practice, especially if you keep your overhead manageable, even with the hit from COVID, I wasn't worried about my long-term stability. I would always have an office to go to. I had a low enough overhead that I, in, in my financial plan, included enough money to withstand a six-month depression in, in cases. And so the COVID really wasn't a stressor for me at that point. I, I knew I would have a job when it was done. I knew I had the money to get to the other side. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Backtable ENT podcast. I am your host, Ashley Agan. I'm here, as always, with my lovely co-host, Gopi Shaw. Hello. And today, we have Dr. DJ Verrett as our guest. He is a facial plastic surgeon in solo private practice in Plano, Texas, which is outside of Dallas. He was born and raised in Lafayette, Louisiana, and attended Tulane University. <laughs> yeah, he's got he's got the he's got the Louisiana connection with you, Gopi. I forgot to tell you. Yeah. Uh, he um, he went to medical school and residency at UT Southwestern, and he did a facial plastics fellowship at University of Missouri Columbia. And in addition to being an excellent clinician, he serves on uh, the board of directors for multiple medical societies. Has had numerous publications and has been featured in several interviews in TV, radio, and printed press. He also recently started his own podcast called Ask Me MD. Um, so welcome to the podcast, DJ. Thanks, Ashley. I appreciate it. Did I miss anything? You have an, an extensive biography and, and are a man of many hats and involved in many things. <laughs> No, I think you hit the high points there. We'll probably start discussing it, you know, along the way. I've also had a bunch of appointments on various hospital boards and boards of directors for nonprofits and all that kind of good stuff. So it, I think it's kind of all the all part of the story of having a successful private practice at the end of the day. Yeah, we we wanted to talk to you today about your about your experience, you know, in in solo private practice and how, how you got started. And why don't you just start giving by just giving our listeners a little a little background um, about you? Sure. So as you as you mentioned, I got my undergraduate degree at Tulane in biomedical engineering. Always knew I wanted to go to medical school, but decided to go the biomedical engineering route so that if I didn't get into medical school or didn't like it. I'd have something to fall back on that I could have a good career with. But mm -hmm. fortunately, ended up getting into UT Southwestern. I was actually waitlisted, got a call about a month before school started from the Dean of Admissions and said, oh, hey, wow. we have a spot if, if you want to be here. And I said, I will be there. And <laughs> so um, yeah. I ended up there and uh, liked it, did some rotations with the ENT department, ended up doing my otolaryngology residency at Southwestern, got towards the end of, of residency and kind of decided that I really liked facial plastics. Also, from a kind of a business standpoint, it gave the opportunity to have a practice that wasn't solely dependent on insurance, but could either be a hybrid or a fully cash pay. And you got to do procedures that people were really interested in, fairly motivated to do. So I ended up doing a fellowship with Keith LaFerrier through the University of Missouri, Columbia, and got towards the end of fellowship and, you know, it, it, and even before the end of fellowship, I guess kind of the end of residency, the question always is, okay, I'm, I've finally finished all this education. I'm done with school, but now I got to go find a real job somewhere, you know? Mm -hmm. And, so and my, yeah, I mean, and, and one of the things that was always frustrating and still is frustrating is that it's really not something that's taught in medical school is any yeah. of the business of medicine or what the opportunities might be once you're done. Yeah. You know, and I, I, I actually tell people now, I said, to be a good doctor, I need to be three things. I need to be a physician, I need to be a businessman, and I need to be an insurance agent. And <laughs> I get taught one of those in medical school. Right. Mm -hmm. But regardless of that, I started looking around and, 
just my personality and, and the opportunity I saw the uh, being in Dallas, I saw the growth that was in the North Dallas area while I was in medical school and residency. And so I decided to uh, to go back and, and open a practice. Fortunately, I was in a position, I was not married at the time, I didn't have children. So it made it a little bit easier to to just go out and I ended up, I tried working with a hospital on a relocation agreement. Unfortunately, that fell through. And so I ended up taking out a loan, finishing out an office and opening my practice January 2nd of 2008. That's when we opened the doors. Wow. So it's, it's been, you know, it's been a lot of fun. It's, it was, it was definitely tough. It's a learning experience. It's kind of interesting though, because if you look at our education process about every four to five years, we enter a new kind of education cycle. Mm -hmm. So you go through four years of college and then you, you enter med school and that's a different education cycle for another four years, four years or five years in our case of, of residency, one year of fellowship, that was a different education cycle. And so I just kind of took it on that for the first five years, which most people say it takes about five years to develop a practice, which is what I found for the next five years, I'm going to figure out how to run a practice. And right. so that's kind of what I did. Take a look at it. That's like your, yeah. your next education cycle was just learning how to, you know, run a practice. Yeah. <laughs> life, and, yeah the life cycle. Right? Yeah. No, Real life it, now. It, it, well, exactly. And, and, and then at the end of that five years, I, I went in, you know, a, a, I still had my practice, obviously it's still physician, but at the end of that five years, I then started looking at working with startup companies and doing investing in startup companies. And, and so it's, you know, it's every five or six years, I got to find something new to, to start a new cycle in. So it's been quite fun. I really like that kind of every five year outlook or goals or redefining just because it, I feel like I need that to kind of keep me going and reset myself because otherwise it feels like this big, you know, open, it's almost too open and I don't know what to do. So I do like that sort of five-year mindset. Yeah. And, and it's not, and it's not even, you know, a lot of people say they have this midlife crisis where they need to change their direction completely. And I don't view it. I don't view it as that at all. It's simply, okay, I've gotten five years into something I've, I've mastered it, or I've, you probably never master it, but but I've gotten the hang of it at least. It's kind of an autopilot thing. It's not really, it's not really as exciting or motivating anymore. So I just need to find something else to kind of keep the spark going. Mm -hmm. And and knowing that I I at least for my practice set it up in a way that I could sustain it and and be happy with what I do. And so you know I read a lot on these physician forums about physicians that are going through burnout and not happy with their jobs or working for large corporations or hospital systems and feeling like they're, they're on a hamster wheel. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't have that at all. I, I, I'm really enjoy what I do and I could do it forever basically. And did you, so when you, when you started out, did you consider any other, you know, practice models or did you kind of just know that for you solo private practice was going to be the only thing that kind of checked all the boxes for you. Yeah, you know, and that's a tough one because at the time I thought solo private practice was the only thing that would check the boxes for me. And part of it was I I didn't have a good appreciation for what all of the practice models actually were. Mm -hmm. And so it really limited my thinking as to what might be the appropriate model for me. And by that, I mean, when I got done with residency, I basically saw the option as either I'm employed by a hospital system, I'm in academics, or, or I'm employed by a, a large group, or I'm, I'm solo private practice. Self-employed. Yeah, I'm self-employed. <laughs> and in, in reality, there are a lot of other, not a lot, but, the, but there's some other permutations of those options that could have allowed me to do what I want to do and maybe not take in so much of the startup cost on myself. You know, one of the, one of the options out there is, is office sharing with somebody where you don't actually have to become financially tied to them. You're not, 
in a, a practice together, but you share the expenses of the office in, in some way, shape or form. I, I didn't even consider that when I came out. Certainly you can enter group practices because I wanted to do facial plastics. I wanted to be able to build that. And most of the practices I looked at just weren't set up for the cosmetic facial plastics. You know, they were mm -hmm. set up for insurance. Right. They really weren't, they didn't have the office space set up for it. They didn't have the look, they didn't have the, the people for cosmetic facial, facial plastics. But in reality, a lot of the groups you can, you can work out even part-time work with the group and then part-time on your own as a facial plastics or, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different ways to set up a practice so that you're able to do what you want, but you can split some of the overhead with people and, and tie into some of the established processes that they have to make the startup a whole lot easier. That's so amazing. I mean, that's so many, so much opportunity there that I had never even thought of. And, and, you know, one of the other things that, that I didn't coming out of going through residency, we always have this mindset of attendings are these far off people that you don't, you don't bother, you know, the, the CEO of the hospital. I mean, I never saw the CEO of Parkland or the CEO of Zale. I, I would, I mean, I, I think I would have evaporated if I tried to walk into their office. <laughs> you know? And, uh, but the reality is if the opportunity is what you make it. And I've, I work with a lot of CEOs now of hospitals. I, if I would have known now what I know then, I would have started making cold calls. I would have called practice managers. I would have called CEOs of hospitals to see if they were doing relocation agreements. I would have called the CEOs of larger groups and said, hey, here's what I'm looking to do. Do you have an opportunity that we can put together? Because a lot of groups, you know, in private practice, a lot of groups aren't actively looking for someone, but if the opportunity arises, they may take advantage of it. And a lot mm -hmm. of hospitals also aren't actively looking and there are, there are opportunities in the hospital for what are called relocation agreements where the hospital will subsidize your first year or two in practice in, in order that you come and you utilize the hospital and you stay in the area for a certain period of time. And then that becomes a loan that, that basically gets paid off by sweat equity for you working in the area. And there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of, of rules and regulations that are that center around that stuff. But, you know, those are all opportunities that I just didn't know about at the time. And so, you know, when you ask, was private practice the only thing in the options that I knew, solo private practice seemed to be the best one for me. But there actually were a lot of others that I wish I would have explored before actually opening my office. So DJ, who helps you understand some of the different financial ways to do this? You've mentioned hospital relocation. You mentioned small business loan from a bank. Did you like talk to a financial advisor? How did, how does somebody get information and to help understand what would be best in terms of interest or, you know, what their ultimate goals are? Yeah, that's a good question. And and there isn't a good answer to that, unfortunately. What I what I've learned, I've learned because of my affiliation with hospitals, because I'm on medical executive committees, because I was on the board of directors of a 501A, which is the in Texas, we have corporate practice of medicine statutes. So physicians can only be employed by other physicians or nonprofit under the 501A statutes. That is that has a board of directors of physicians. So all of the, the corporate practices are actually 501As. I was on the board of directors for a 501A for about 900 physicians around the state of Texas. So through all of through all of that over the last you know 12 or 13 years, I've learned about those opportunities. Unfortunately, there's not one location you can go to and say, hey, here's what I'd like to do. What's my best option out there? there? There really isn't that opportunity that's set up, unfortunately. Wow. Can you talk to us about, you know, how you go about, you know, setting up your office, setting up your equipment and getting supplies, getting your staff, 
getting patients. I know that's a lot of a lot of things, but uh, the the there's a lot to do to kind of get a practice off the ground. Do you have any pearls of wisdom, you know, that you that you learned through that process? Yeah, so that one, you know, there there are some resources in that regard of kind of the the nuts and bolts and the steps. In Texas, the Texas Medical Association actually has a practice consulting arm that can help people walk through the steps. Local medical societies often have a checklist you can get of kind of all of the steps that might be necessary to start a practice. I actually was introduced to a practice management company. And so they are kind of consultants to to walk you through the steps of, of setting everything up. What I found was a lot of it even even if you get people involved, these practice management companies, even if you get them involved, there's still a lot of steps that are just on you to to take care of and to do. Certain things you just, you have to do, they can't do for you, but they can kind of provide you a checklist. So some of the big things, you know, number one, you have to determine what legal entity you're going to, you're going to have. So you're going to want a lawyer. Uh, you're going to want a lawyer who's versed in healthcare law. Lawyers are just like doctors. They all specialize in something. So you don't mm-hmm. want the estate planner to be your healthcare lawyer. Um, <laughs> and, and right now, I literally have a Rolodex of lawyers for different, different things, unfortunately. You know, but if, I, if I'm investing in a company, I have one lawyer. If I have a healthcare question, I have one lawyer. If I have an employment issue, I have another lawyer, you know, so... You end up kind of accumulating those as you go along. You'll also want a CPA because some of the legal entities also have a tax entity you'll have to determine, uh, whether you're what's called a C corporation, an S corporation, or even a disregarded entity, and there there are tax implications that go along with it. So you're going to want to talk to a CPA about it. And you're going to want to have some idea if you're going to bring on people in the future because the the way you set it up initially, you can always change it. You're not completely locked into it, but certain of the certain of the structures allow for an easier way to bring additional doctors on in the future. And others are a little bit more difficult. Once you do that, you at the kind of at the same time, you have to determine a name for the practice. And so my my official name is BJ Verrett MDPA, but I have a doing business as is Innovations Facial Plastic Surgery. And, you know, in, if, in hindsight, I actually should have just gone with innovations, facial plastic surgery. I think, you know, one of the problems with naming your practice by your name is when it's time to, to sell the practice or bring other people on, you know, nobody wants to join BJ Verrett MDPA, but <laughs> they'll join in innovations, facial plastic surgery, right? Like, <laughs> it, so, but we have the DBA, so so most of our advertising is done under Innovation Spatial Plastic Surgery. Then, at, and then after you get that set up, then you can apply for what's called an EIN, Employer Identification Number. That's basically the Social Security number for businesses. You get that from the IRS. And the entity and the legal entity is going to depend on which state you're in. Some states you have to have their professional designations to the entity. For example, professional associations or professional limited liability companies. In other states, you can just be an LLC or a limited partnership. I mean, that's kind of state dependent. Then after you get your EIN, then basically it's time to go figure out where you want to set up shop. You know, that's kind of the, the next thing that you're going to want to do, because unless you find an office that's exactly like you want, it's likely to take three to six months, probably six months, maybe even longer. By the time you get the construction on the the inside of the the building done, get equipment in, all the permits that you need, that usually is a three to six month process, usually closer to about six months. And there's a lot that goes into commercial real estate. Commercial real estate is very different from residential real estate. So usually you're going to want to find a commercial realtor who's dealt in healthcare again and, and knows the area you're in. And they can usually guide you through most of that process fairly easily. It's not difficult, but it is, again, it's a new learning thing. It, it, yeah. It's something else to kind of figure out. So but if you, 
if you did this through a hospital relocation, do they kind of direct or help you with all this stuff and also help you figure out practice location and all that stuff? Are you still getting all this information and then they might help subsidize it? For the most part, the hospitals may have some people that they work with on those relocation agreements. Like they may be able to give you the name of a realtor or the name of a practice management person. But for the most part, consider a relocation agreement like a like a bank loan. And that's it. Okay. You're, you're signing an agreement with them. They give you money. There's some repayment schedule affiliated with it or some payoff. For instance, if you stay in the area for three years, then a third of the loan forgives every year or something like that. But they're not usually going to direct what you do. And in fact, they can't because in a relocation agreement, you are an independent practitioner, not directly affiliated with the hospital. And the hospital can't tell you what to do. They can say, if you don't practice in our service area for a certain period of time, then you have to repay the loan we gave you. But beyond that, they can't, they can't direct your practice. It would actually be violation of federal law. So from that aspect, you know, they, they can potentially, especially if they've done several relocation agreements, they can guide you to, you know, the experts that can help you or, you know, people that may be able to help you set things up, but, but generally they're not going to do that for you. So you've kind of decided you're going to do solo practice. You go and you find your place you build it out and you, you hang your shingle, you, you pick a name. What's, what's the next step? Fi- finding staff to help? Yeah. So kind and of who's the, the most step... important in that group? <laughs> yeah. Well, so the next step is going to be actually getting equipment, right? Ah, so yes. you need, you need chairs, you need office furniture, you need exam chairs, you need supplies, and the, the used equipment, used medical equipment, there are brokers all over the place now with the internet. You can find them fairly easily and they can, they can help get you set up. Even if they're remote, they can, ship, they can ship stuff to you. In the DFW area, there's several vendors that deal in used medical equipment. So I found one of those guys and they came to my office. I told them what I needed. I told them what my budget looked like and they came in and, and set me up. No problem. Start with a pretty lean setup. Like, did you did you start with just you know I just want kind of the minimum till I'm you know busy enough, or did you is there a sweet spot to where okay if I if I don't have enough space to see at least this many patients, I'm never going to cover my overhead. Is, you know what I'm you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, and, and that's something I was I was about to talk about. You read my mind. One of one of the really important things to remember when you start a, a practice. So you come from residency, and in your residency, you have a clinic that has, you know, 15 rooms, it has a couple of nurses, you have all the scopes you want, you have brand new microscopes that have recording equipment on them, and you have all the support staff that you could use, right? When you get out into practice, all of that stuff costs money, and it's basically coming out of your salary. Mm -hmm. So when, when you start out, start out lean. Always, always, always. So for me, my office when I started out, and it's actually still my office, is 1,500 square feet. Wow. I have two exam rooms. I have a procedure room. I have two offices, two bathrooms, a kitchen area, and a reception area, and a very small waiting room. I have three chairs in my waiting room. That's it. But the reality is, if you think about it, I'm one person in the office. I can't see more than one patient at a time. So Mm -hmm. it becomes schedule management that I have two rooms for patients to wait in and on a normal day, not during COVID, obviously, but I have three chairs for people to wait up front and that's it. So I I shouldn't need more than that space for me as an individual, right? Right. So you know, if you start out small though, my, my rent was extremely manageable. I started out with just one receptionist, but that also meant I had to do a lot of jobs. So I didn't have an, a medical assistant. I actually still don't. I take out my own sutures. I do my own bandage changes. I do my own patient education. I, I create my own claims. Now my receptionist takes care of 
dealing with appeals and that kind of thing. But most, you, you, you kind of get this trade-off of, do I want to pay somebody to do it and take on that overhead? Or do I want to do it myself and save the money, right? And especially when you're starting out, you want to save the money because let's say I had built out a 6,000 square foot office and assuming that I'm at some point going to grow into it. Well, as my practice evolved, I made certain decisions and I'm still in my 1500 square foot office and very happy with it. Mm -hmm. So, so the one thing I would, I would always say is start small. You can always grow bigger if you need to, you can't always become smaller. I think a lot of, fortunately, a lot of doctors get caught in the, the big practice scenario and they start working for their overhead. And, and, it, and, and my, my thinking kind of came from actually my mentor and fellowship. You know, he, at one point he told me he had over a hundred thousand dollars a month in overhead. Wow. And, and there were some months where he actually, he had been in practice for years, but he actually had to pay the practice to cover the overhead because the, the month was slow. And I just, I said, I never want to be in that situation. Unfortunately, I haven't been. So are you, is it just you and your receptionist or do you have a practice manager or are you basically the practice manager as well? Th that's it. I have, and, and now at, at one point I did, I had two, two people and a practice manager, but I've, I've actually shrunk back down and I have just a, a receptionist. That's it. That's awesome. <laughs> and do you, you know, getting back to overhead, is there a, is there a sweet spot where you where like, I have a goal of like, I, I want my overhead to be, you know, this percent of, you know, or I guess you would say this percent of what I'm making goes to overhead, you know? Yeah, I think, month. I mean, overall, if I guess I think, different. yeah, everybody's a little bit different, but overall, I think the 40 to 50% range should be a good overhead amount at the end of the day. And, and you have to remember too, though, when you're starting up, obviously overhead is going to be a much larger percentage. I mean, for instance, mm -hmm. when I started, I, I didn't make my resident salary the first year. I made just over my resident salary the second year. And it was the third year before I actually made a respectable salary. So, you know, it takes a little while, but never look back after that. And, and it's, Part of the overhead, though, also, if, if, as you start structuring things, you know, part of, part of an overhead in the office goes towards the, the lease, right? Well, I bought my building a couple of years into practice, so I'm paying myself lease. So even though technically it's part of my overhead, it's going to pay the mortgage on the building that I own that's equity for me. So, you know, it's, it's, even though I aim for 40 to 50%, because of the way I structured it, a percentage of that is, is actually coming back to me. Mm -hmm. So DJ, in terms of like your work week, then how much or of your time, how much do you, what's the balance in terms of clinical practice and then practice management? Yeah. So I, I kind of set aside about a half day a week for practice management. And, you know, it, it, it's, and that's my choice. I've chosen instead of hiring a billing company, instead of hiring an HR company, instead of hiring, you know, a practice manager, instead of hiring a credentialing company, instead of doing those things, I do them because it, it, at the end of the day, it doesn't take that much time and it's worth it to me to to keep checks on certain of those things and not pay somebody else for it that I then have to manage. As you get bigger, it, it doesn't make sense to spend time on that stuff. You know, if you end up creating a group and you have two or three people in the group, you need a practice manager. There, there's, you're going to have to have, you know, 10 employees or something like that. You need somebody to be able to manage those people. But in, in the small groups, I don't need, you don't need to start having a practice manager and a receptionist and a billing person because you're just, you're, you're paying the money when you're not going to keep them busy enough 
to really necessitate those roles. So, you know, it, it, it's always a trade-off, but to me, it's always been worth it because I just didn't see the need to, to bring on that much overhead. Yeah, that makes sense. So are you also then your patient scheduling surgery for the patient directly having to you know discuss claims or something like that directly then? Or does your receptionist help you with that? No, my receptionist takes care of that. No. And that and and that's the other thing is, you know, we we kind of have these roles in mind. So when I say receptionist, she's not the person that answers the phone and schedules your appointment in the office. You know, she's much more than just a receptionist. And so she's, you know, she's paid commensurate with her duties. And so it, it's, it's looking to kind of combine those jobs because, again, I'm only one physician. Each, each one of those deals, so scheduling surgery, rebutting claims, getting preauthorization, I don't do enough of any one of those to necessitate one person dedicated to it. I can actually have one person to actually do all three of them. And that's the way I've set up my practice. And then in the last, so one thing I wanted to ask you was, you know, every month we get what we, what's called the dashboard and it kind of tells us, you know, what our progress has been in terms of our views and, you know, then they'll try to break it down by like, like productivity I, metrics, yeah, productivity metrics. What are, what are your productivity metrics or how do you, what do you use or what do you look at? to check your growth and progress and how routinely do you do it? Yeah. So, you know, good question. And, and for me, ultimately it comes to bottom line. You know, I am, I am paid by what I collect. And so collections and outstanding balances, amount of time that claims are still out, number of claims that are rejected, those are the metrics that I look at. So they're more the financial side of things. What I've come to learn is if I looked at it every month, I would, I would probably have a heart attack. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of reasons. There are natural fluctuate, even without COVID, there are natural fluctuations in productivity, in patients coming into the office, in mm -hmm. claims payments. And so I, I look at that stuff more on a quarterly basis and compare year over year as opposed to quarter to quarter, because I believe that the year over year will take into account those natural variations for me. So, for instance, you know, when schools right back in in August and mm -hmm. September, we see a we see a slowdown yeah. right? because every, nobody's coming in to have surgery. Right. Well, if I compared September to August or September to July, you know, I'm going to start having a heart attack because, oh, my goodness, my volumes are down. Right. But if I look at July, August and September of 2020 versus July, August and September of 2019, it captures that natural fluctuation and I can see kind of how we're doing now in reality that I can also look at my calendar and know, okay. I'm seeing a whole lot less people than I was last year, or I'm doing less surgeries. And so, you know, if I'm seeing a, a three month decline where every single month I'm, it's going down, then we'll evaluate, try to evaluate what's going on. But overall, I try to do quarterly evaluations because I just think month to month, there's too much variability really to make it, make it a useful metric for me. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, is there, um, is there any, you know, you mentioned several things, but is, is there anything else that we haven't asked you about where, you know, you, you would, um, you know, looking back to your, to your younger self graduating at a fellowship that, that you would tell yourself that, you know, you, you wish you knew then that, you know, now. Yeah. What should we be telling our, ourselves and our, and our, and our residents right <laughs> our now? Our residents. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, number one is don't let anybody ever tell you that, you can't do private practice. You can. It, it's like anything else. It's just something you have to learn. You have to work at. It's not going to be given to you, but you can do it. Number two, as we've seen, especially during the time of COVID, I think a lot of people thought, look, I don't want to deal with the administration of a practice. I don't want to deal with the variability. I'm going to go to work for a hospital system and I'm going to have a secure job and get a paycheck. 
And as we've learned, that's not always the case. Physicians can be fired just like anybody else. Yeah. Whereas, you know, with my practice, especially if you keep your overhead manageable, even with the hit from COVID, I wasn't worried about my long-term stability. I would always have an office to go to. I had a low enough overhead that I, in, in my financial plan, included enough money to withstand a six-month depression in, in cases. And so the COVID really wasn't a stressor for me at that point. I, I knew I would have a job when it was done. I knew I had the money to get to the other side. And it was just getting through the flood at that point. So, you know, don't think that a hospital job is necessarily a guarantee or that a private practice is destined to fail. Neither one is, is true for sure. And number three, as I mentioned, your, your practice is going to be what you make it. Don't be afraid to call people. Don't be afraid to cold call people. I would, I would welcome, I, I, and I always do, I welcome calls from people looking to set up practice, even in my area. You know, if I, I'm, I'm very comfortable with the practice I have. I have my referral patterns. And somebody else, there's enough business around. Having another person in town isn't going to dramatically affect my business. And I think most, most folks understand that one more person in town isn't isn't as big of a deal in most, especially most urban areas, and would be happy to at least, you know, give you some thoughts on here's, here's things to think about or some referrals for people to work with. But, but don't be afraid to reach out, reach out to CEOs of hospitals if it's somewhere that you want to work. Even if you, if you want to be employed by the hospital, reach out to the CEO and talk to them because they're not afraid. They're, they're happy to hear from you and they'll put you in touch with their people that take care of those things but it's always what you make of it. Nobody's going to walk into your lap and say, Hey, here's a, here's a practice. Come on, work for me, and, <laughs> right. you know, make top 5% AMG and A. Congratulations. You know, it doesn't happen. Yeah. So. yeah. I think that's great advice. I think we could probably talk about this for hours on end, but I think that's probably a good place to, to put a pin in it. So thank you so much for, for coming today. It was, it was a pleasure talking to you. I learned um, so much, so much. I wish I'd known some of that five, five, <laughs> 10 years. I mean, it's nice to know now. I mean, you know, there's always room for change or, you know what I mean? It, it seems like, like you said, once you're, you know, medical school, residency, fellowship, there's like this fixed path. And it, we, it's important to keep reminding ourselves that, you know, you can make changes and you have choices. And so I think your story, your example is, I mean, you're an example of that. So thank you. That was super. It was awesome. You're welcome. Sure. One, one parting comment, and, and this is something I've always believed, being a doctor provides you a job, it is, a jo is a guaranteed job for life. Now, it may not be the location you want or the exact, exact job you want, but it is the one profession out there that you will always have a job in. So it's just making the most of it to, to get you where you want to be. Yeah. Good advice. DJ, if, if our listeners want to find you on social media, where, where can they go? Yeah, absolutely. As you mentioned, I'm, I actually have a new, uh, new podcast out there called Ask Me MD, and we talk about a lot of these business and medicine issues. Uh, so they can check, it, check us out at askmemdpodcast.com. Or if they want uh, to contact me through the practice, it's innovationsfps, like facialplasticsurgery.com. Either way, I'm happy to happy to help as I can. Awesome. Very I'm excited cool. to tune in. <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right. Very good. Well, thank you for joining. Listeners, for um, please check us out on um, Twitter and Instagram. We are at, at underscore backtable ENT. Send us your thoughts and let us know what how you felt about the podcast and what other topics you might be interested in hearing. It's a wrap. That's a wrap. Have a good one. <laughs>